Hello, everyone. Today I'm with Taria Ward. So welcome, Taria. Hello, John. It's nice to be with you and your audience. Thanks for inviting me. Taria, I'm not going to go through your full bio again because we just spoke, I think it was about a month ago now, maybe. Oh, right. right, yeah. But, you know, uh, the this, this story was that you were a minister. This is this, as I remember from when we were talking you were okay. a, you were a minister you stumbled across melanoma soma in the in the basement of uh some building and he was talking and you had a kind of a mini epiphany if we could call it that and it, it struck some deep chord in you is the way maybe i'd describe it and uh you did your PhD at Pacifica and you came up with reawakening the indigenous psyche within the Western mind, which was basically what um, what that experience awakened in you, maybe when you when you when you stumbled across Melodome so no. Is that kind of a good way of describing it? Yes, you have a good memory. It was it was maladoma. It was certainly that evening that I felt like something awakened in me that had just been sleeping. And once it was awake, it was just going to have its life. It wasn't going back to sleep. And it was surprising and shocking and wonderful and terrifying. And it led me on a huge journey that ended up resigning from the ministry and doing a lot of Indigenous work with people from all over all over Mexico, Canada, Africa. Yeah. Um, it yeah. took you. So it took I, you down a different path. Probably not something you were expecting at the time. No, I felt like I'd been abducted, and it was all <laughs> fine. It was, but it was not fine a lot of the time too. It was. Uh, it was rough. It was a rough go. But it was, you know, it was what what my soul wanted, and that's often challenging, right? When the soul finally decides to direct your life rather than let well, your I, mind direct it. <laughs> I, I always think, you know, I know it's kind of a classic, but it's Joseph Campbell, you know, wandering out into the forest. It's like, it's okay to talk about these adventures, but sometimes you just have to kind of wander into the unknown. And at the time, you're usually not going, you know, great, I'm just going out into the forest. <laughs> You usually kind of have a few, uh, a little bit of something in the background. Right, yeah. It's uh, it's definitely the the wandering, the, you know, the getting lost so that you can find your way again differently and more yeah. authentically. So, yes. Yeah. So. And, then, and then you, for a long time, you had a retreat. You're in North Carolina, aren't you? You're up in the... Appalachians. Uh, I moved out of Los Angeles into the mountains of Western North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And what we've been talking about, Tari, is that, you know, for the Substack community, Jung and the World Substack community, that from time to time, we, you and I could do something together and you, because your work has revolved a lot about dreams. And, uh, and and assisting people with their dreams and that kind of dream work. So we thought that we could um, perhaps engage with the community um, on Jung and the World and, and, and from time to time take up this topic of dreams. So, I mean, I wonder whether maybe a place to start is your, can you tell us a little bit about your work, your approach, um, sure. Yes. I'd love to, John. I'd love to. Um, my doctorate is in depth psychology. So certainly I, I learned much about the Jungian work with dreams mm -hmm. through my doctoral work and through being in analysis for the better part of 20 years and working with my analysts and my own dreams. Um, <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me. When I started my retreat center out here in the mountains, because is, of my is, interest. Is, sorry, just before we go on, is that water or is that vodka you've got there in the. the... You think I'm going to tell you? 
Okay. Every anyway. time I say it once, you should bring your wine in a teacup <laughs> so you can blow on it and then just drink it on. No, actually, this is water with a little bit of lime in it, though, so it does okay. look exotic. Excellent. Sorry. Moving right along. The vodka will come later. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's see. Where was I? Um, I think I was saying that, oh, because of my interest in the indigenous work that you know that got ignited really with maladoma and then i ended up exploring that quite extensively and deeply and wrote my dissertation called reawakening indigenous sensibilities in the western psyche mm -hmm. and i was teaching and working with though the concepts around awakening the indigenous mind which was so powerful and important to me as i we were talking about living in Los Angeles, teaching it, you know, in these little classrooms off the 405 freeway, um, and finally decided to move that I needed to live myself to live authentically with this, you know, awakening and with this calling, I needed to move into the wilderness and live by myself alone in the mountains, which I did. And uh, so I uh, found a perfect little spot in the in the remote mountains of uh, Western North Carolina. And I had retreats about every third month yeah. for four days. And at the retreats in the mornings, I would listen to people's dreams. And then the afternoon we would do work with, you know, getting our, into the heart of nature and work, working in many ways with rituals and vision quests and so forth. But the dream work um, was what we did every morning when people awakened. Um, and it, and then it ended up that the dream work is just what followed me between retreats. People started calling me and wanted to talk to, to uh, about uh, their dreams. And then after nine years on the mountain, I sold my retreat center and moved into Asheville. And the dream work followed me there. That my my practice of working with people in their dreams. Um, just grew organically it just happened i didn't even think of it it, it found me and uh, and i was happy to do it i was very aligned to it but what i'll share with your um your community is that for me the the jungian style of working with the dream as a personal message from your own unconscious that's trying to help you to get aware of how the unconscious is working through your complexes and the different symbols and memories and so forth uh, is valuable and important work. And I, and I can tell you the origin of this, when I read a book called Voices of the First Day by Robert Lawler, I definitely recommend it to anyone, mm. but he talks about uh, the awakening in the Aboriginal dream time. And as soon as I read even the first many pages of that book, bingo, I felt awake again, like the way Maladoma had awakened me. This was awake. And then I understood what the Aboriginal Dreamtime concept is, and that this, the way of the dream and the dreaming is an aspect, a dimension of our own psyche and of our own consciousness that is available at all times, mm -hmm. that is always there. And when we go into our dreams of the night, we're exploring in these dimensions of the dreaming, but also the Aboriginal people say the Western person has gone crazy because they only dream at night. They walk in and out of the dreaming dimension, awake and asleep at will, whenever they want. They're in and out of the dimension of the psyche that is the dreaming and that the earth itself is dreaming. And when we're in the dreaming of the earth, we are walking in this dream time. And so I see dreams with this awareness of the dreaming as a dimension of the world and its own soul and of this of our own personal psyches and uh the soul of the self and so that we're wandering about in the dream time and that we have experiences i have had many experiences uh, it's just amazing little stories here and there of people that i've met in the dreaming and then i meet them in waking life and so i know that i've been with them in this other dimension that we are known to each other in this other dimension and then you happen to meet in this dimension and 
and then it's all you know you see it's like the invisible world and the visible world they're not separate they're uh, just one you know full fabric you know different uh sort of like frequencies on the same wavelength of reality um, yeah it's so, so ex it's so expand you know that's what i call the animal mundi, the world the, the soul of the world mm -hmm. or whatever it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. i I could be all technical about dreams and say this is the anima and that's an animus figure and all this and that, but it's kind of like to move into that uh, larger, wider, more mysterious kind of world of soul is to be in the dreaming, isn't it? It's like, you know, we're in it. Right, right, yeah, and that everything dreams the plants are dreaming the trees are dreaming babies are dreaming animals are dreaming the birds are dreaming the wind is dreaming it's all part of the big dream you know and once you're in the dreaming you understand the language and the consciousness and the connection to all of it because we're all not separate parts but all one part one one sort of field of reality that is distinguished here and there by you know different ways our pattern integrity as Buckminster Fuller would say is set up but it's all part of the same big design mm -hmm. so um yeah it's and and, and, that, I, and that seems to me Tari is sometimes when someone else has a dream and it speaks to you so much it's not just your own like what you were saying it's not just your own dreams or your the personal things that are coming out because someone like you've spoken about a couple of your dreams uh, to me and they've been so relevant to me. So it's kind of like there's this, uh, uh, you know, again, this wider kind of net that's happening, isn't right. it? Right. Yes. And and uh, we have had a monthly dream symposium um, that we've been doing once a month for a year. You can find out about them on my website if you ever want to come. They're free and they're readily available once a month you'll find the time and the link to come but it, in those symposiums we started that because we were aware my colleague and I Jocelyn Starfeather and I were aware that indigenous people wake up in the morning um, and uh, listen to each other's dreams listen to the dreams of the of the community and that's how the village is conducted by the dreaming of the community and they get the sort of the collect the the message of the dream for the whole community uh, by listening to each other's dreams and then they know sort of how to conduct their lives they, it's it's based in the dreaming and then they listen to the dreams of the community and we thought i wish we could get up and talk about our dreams and so then we decided to create this symposium where we can listen to the collective message in the dream because a lot of these dreams have messages for the entire community and it was frustrating to me to be in my private office listening to one person's dream that I wish I could tell the whole world because it felt like a message, a story, a myth, you know, a truth, a value that needed to be communicated and I was the only one hearing it, you know, in my private little office and and so that's why, you know, I just think they're, the dreams are meant to be shared with the community and they have meaning for the full community. Many of them are, you know, are should be our way of understanding what's really going on. Do they yeah. always have a collective kind of meaning, or do some have more of a collective meaning than others? You know. Well, probably more than some more than others, but you know, my sense, and this is the way I talk about them, and you know, uh, any any way that we define a dream is going to be limited. But in my <coughs> sense every dream has different layers. So there's a layer of it that's very much related to your daily life, your personal unconscious and the things you need to know. And that's really important and really valuable, but it'll have a, like a, a layer for your ancestral line. It'll have a layer for maybe your past life history. If people believe that. it'll have a layer that's meant for the whole community that because we are created by, you know, this larger context. And so it's always going to be, having something, you know, in the archetypal dimensions and in the mystic dimensions of, you know, of value to the larger uh, field of consciousness. So my sense is that every dream has has most of these layers. Now, some some 
are very obviously personal and some are very obviously transpersonal. Um, but, you know, at, uh, but every one of them, I think you can find these, these very personal or transpersonal dimensions to them. So, yeah, it's a good question, though. And can you tell me about the dream you had in the in the desert in Africa? Oh, because that one. That might yeah. have a collective <laughs> kind of uh, relevance, if you ask me. Okay, you're talking about the the tiger dream that I just shared with you before. Mm. Okay, so yes, so this dream I had. It was probably in the late nineties. So what's that, 25 years ago or so? Um, and this was when I was just uh, working on my dissertation, the one that I mentioned, Reawakening Indigenous Sensibilities in the Western Psyche. And I was in the process, I had been sent by life experience and breakdown experience into the depths of, you know, the depths of the psyche. And I felt like I'd had an education in the deep, dark recesses of, you know, how that goes sometimes during a breakdown. Mm. And it was awakening me to the archaic consciousness that, that exists below all these structures of who we think we are, who we, you know, the collective mind and so forth. Um, and I found the richness of what was there that I would think was being awakened in me and I was trying to find words for it, you know, to write into a academic paper, you know, mm. and so I was doing research and, and trying to find words. And sometimes uh, you will hear the indigenous people say, and even many of the mystics say, if you, if you say a thing, you kill it. If you give it words, you kill it. Mm. There's a, you know, there's something in the spirit of a thing it doesn't want to be spoken. And if you speak it, then you've killed it, but then you've also been able to share it. So there's a, you know, there's a real edge there. And I was having that experience. Like, how do I say these things that are almost unsayable? How do I say the unsayable things? And that's what I was working with in writing. So then I have this dream. So in the dream, I am moving into my new home, which, you know, wasn't something that was literally happening. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. Um, and my my new home was on, like on the Serengeti Plains, vast, vast, vast plains and desert. And uh, there were some, there was a piece of property that I was moving into. This is my new home. And there was a woman there who was a caretaker who was showing me around the property, you know, around, there were different buildings there. And, um, and, um, as she was showing me around, I looked out across the vast plains and all of a sudden, just I could see loping toward me in a very steady and determined way were these two white tigers. And I have one right here sitting next to me, looking at me all the time. Uh, one of these guys. Um, so that actually two of these guys were coming across the plains looking at me and I locked eyes with one of them and she was approaching me. And as she got close enough for me to see her, I saw that she had, she was giving birth and the baby was half out and she laid at my feet and wanted me to give birth. And the baby was coming out of her heart. And I heard in the dream, these words, the birth canal of the heart. And this baby was being born through, through the, the birth, birth canal of the heart. Of the That's heart. Beautiful. Mm. And so in the dream, I was I I helped her birth this baby. The baby came out and I was holding the baby while the other tiger was tending to the mother, and the mother was needing tending. So I was holding the baby. And I remember having the a little bit of anxiety in the dream. It's like well, if I'm holding this baby just after birth, the baby's maybe bonding with me and maybe that's not good. It should be bonding with its mother. But the mother wasn't ready to have that. She was needing tending by the other tiger. So the baby was bonding with me. Um, 
And mm -hmm. so in working with that dream and discussing with my analyst and just working with it myself, I realized that this indigenous work, the, that was the baby that was laid at my feet to now bond with and um and that it was it was related to because the, the indigenous people always say that they think with the heart that the western person thinks with the head and that's why we've gone insane because this is not meant to be the thinking apparatus that we that conducts our lives it's meant to be the heart knowledge wisdom sense uh which was the, maybe the struggle you were having in that uh in in that th thesis or dissertation is um how does one think how to get it heart. up to the head <laughs> yeah from the dark recesses of the heart wisdom to something that could be communicated through intellectual and academic rigor mm. so how to bridge that gap was the thing i was having but this this um and so i think that was the you know that was the birthing that i've been tending you know, in all the years since then, is this indigenous mind? So that's um, that's a, what we would call a big dream, isn't it? It's a, it's a. I, I mean, I don't know, but it's probably something you remember a lot in your life. That dream, you probably remember it every week somehow. Or... I remember it, yeah, all the time. It's always just beneath, just behind the, you know, my waking consciousness is this dream. It's 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 one of I. I don't wonder how many I've had, but maybe a dozen dreams that have been the, the huge dreams of my life. And it's one of those. It's like one of the biggest ones. Um, and it certainly has directed my life and has given an image for what I do and why I do it um, and why it's so important to me because of this bonding that was happening. Yeah. And sometimes I think, when, again, like you know, with Hillman, when he talks about callings and the dame on them, you know, being born with a particular daemon is kind of like, but even there, like if you go back to the dream, it's all this dream is telling you about uh, the specifics of, right. of really of what one is here to do or, or to be involved with. Or... Right. It's so interesting because it it gives you a map. You know, it gives you a direction to follow, even though it's not linear or logical, certainly. Um, but it's like, OK, now I know what to do. I know where I'm going. And, um, you know, I can't say it in words, but I know you know what you know. <laughs> and so, yeah, these these dreams end up just, you know, telling us who we are and how to live our lives in such important ways. Yeah. You know, didn't Jung say somewhere like, uh, "What the the stone that is rejected?" Or it's kind of like dreams are so incredibly valuable, but we treat them as if we're they're, they're worthless sometimes, perhaps, aren't they? I mean, in in the in the economic world, what is a dream? What value has a dream? It's got zero <laughs> zero economic value, but the value of what's coming through is. Uh, to do with the heart and soul, to do with the vocation, the real vocation, to do with everything about about right. all. Yeah, yeah. The cornerstone that's been re there, the stone that's been rejected becomes the cornerstone of the of the. Yeah, I think that's actually in the New Testament. Um, John, I went to a an exhibit in London one year. I was there, and. Uh, I can't remember where it was. It was at some science building that they had a, a a big show that they were doing or a big special thing on dreams and dreaming. And so some of my friends were like, Tari, you gotta, you, you're gonna have to see this exhibit. We were all excited. And I went and they had all these dioramas of all the um, um people on beds that were all hooked up to wires and the different, you know, experiments they'd been doing and research they'd been doing and all around the dreaming. And they knew then how many dreams we had at night and how the dream, you know, all this information they had. The and at the very REM time. Yeah, like all the yeah, all the different kinds of sleep and the dreaming sleep and how much we need and how you anyway, all the scientific stuff. Yeah. And then at the very end of the dioramas they had, they had this thing that said, and so in conclusion, you know, do dreams have any meaning? 
And the answer was no. That was what the scientists had to say. That, you know, this is like something our brain waves need, but it's not anything that has purpose or meaning. And I thought, these scientists, they spent all this time and all this money. And I thought, you give me one of those scientists six months mm. of listening to their dreams and working with their dreams, mm. and then see if they want to say, no, there's no point to it. Their minds oh, would be blown. Oh, get them to read them, Albert Einstein. Help them their own dreams. Get them yeah. to read Albert Einstein's, um, you know, biography, because uh, so much of his scientific work came from the actual dream. Right, exactly. He got the theory of relativity in a dream. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of these major pieces of music were born out in, in the dreams. Um, can yeah. you tell, can you share one other, perhaps, that comes to mind, you know, within the context of um, awakening the indigenous psyche within the modern Western mind. One that's also had a big influence on you okay. along the way. Well, I know this one that we, I'll tell the, the Uluru dream uh, as, you know, since it's something that had grabbed your attention when I spoke to you of it. You know, I have several of these kinds of dreams, but in this one, it was, uh, it was one of the simpler dreams, but I'll never forget it. Mm. And in this dream, I'm very busy about my life. Um, it seems like, I, again, it feels like I'm sort of in the desert and in the wilderness, but that's where my busy life is taking place. It's sort of those landscapes of soul and psyche that are more wild, mm. um, maybe not so urban, but, um, but very busy and active in my life. And then occasionally I would have to wander across this vast plain and just go touch this big stone. And as soon as I, you know, had my moments with just putting my hand up on the big stone, then I could go back and do my life. And so in the dream, I just kept sort of, it was like time, as time goes by, I would see myself wandering across the plain and going over and touching the stone, being with the stone and then coming back. And it was always going back to the stone that kept me sort of in the right, yeah. I don't know, gave me energy, gave me vision, gave me, you know, a sense of life, uh, kept me alive, kept me going. And and then I realized when I woke awakened, that dream was was of Uluru. It and it, this was Australia. And so it was the Aboriginal probably consciousness and sense of the dreaming and the dream time mm -hmm. that I was you know that I was inhabiting there and that I was always having to go and touch that stone of mm -hmm. the aboriginal consciousness and the the archaic consciousness of the dreaming mm -hmm. and as soon as I and as long as I kept in touch with that my life was on track and directed uh, so yeah that dream has been really important and i just feel it you know i just feel that that's what i continually do in the dream time i i can relate to that very much and i i think um well what's what is it it's fashionable again if i could draw on hillman for a little while you know like we carry our soul with us wherever we go into the marketplace you know into the shop whatever and that's that's true that's good you know but i find the need to to touch base, if you want to put it that way, or go back. Maybe the jargon is the temenos or the stone or the philosopher's stone or something, but it's to go back to what's really old. And uh, uh, it's almost like it's an interplay. To me, life's an interplay between those two things. It's like to go out and 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 what is it, the expression or the 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 mingling with humanity or whatever, but to always be able to go back. And if there's a, I mean, it's not a very good word, but a touchstone within our own soul to be able to go back to is, is that's a great gift. Actually, that is a good word, touchstone. I mean, it, it you know, it, it means something to everyone, doesn't it? It's like there's, somehow there's an instinct about what that means, a touchstone. And that's what my dream was. And I hadn't even really thought of that term, mm -hmm. but that's, you know, yeah, yeah. And so how, how do you see that 
relating to Hillman's uh, work with the, the dreams and the dreaming? Oh, well, I, I think one, one thing I get from Hillman is that he, he's not a big fan of just the consulting room, analysis in the consulting room. And he's right. like, well, the soul is natural. Like you were saying, dreaming is natural. He's very much, uh -huh. you know, we, we, wherever we go, we take the soul and we take it even, like I think he said to Stan Marlin, you know, everything's political. And, you know, so he's about the world, taking the soul into the world. But I, I would take maybe more from Jung that the new often comes out of the very old. You know, it comes out of the the ancient, the archaic, the the depth of that. Um, is, uh, and I think even Hillman said, you know, Jung uh, opened the mouth of the dead or whatever. But it's like we have to go back to that. That's how I would see it. So uh -huh. I would say there's a balance between, like, it's not all just out there in the field of action, you know. Right. That's how you yeah. do it. I mean, that's how I'd say it for myself. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think that's what the dreams really are. Dreams of the night are our touchstones, aren't they? they I think that's what re reinvigorates, reactivates our, our soul work, you know, re knits our body and spirit together. Yeah. Uh, in a certain way yeah yeah i love that yeah right. well terry i mean what we had spoken about was that perhaps people would like to engage with uh, you know um, what we're calling the the dreaming you mm -hmm. know uh the dream time um is that perhaps people would like to send in a big dream and they could either become part of a podcast with us or maybe they could just write it down and send it in and be anonymous if that felt more is that kind of the thing that would uh that we were discussing yes i think you know i think that was a great idea that um you know i appreciate your idea that that to have sort of a a context here for the dreaming of the community that you're speaking with um, and a place where where the dreams can be, you know, get some airtime. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, what's coming through the dreaming of the people in the community can be um, can be listened to. We can hear, you know, what the dreaming mind wants to put on these airwaves uh and you know help us all to consider together and and uh work with together in terms of their uh messages for all of us so um so yeah i think we were sort of thinking that if somebody wanted to send in one of their dreams that's you know that feels important to them that might like to be spoken to the community um if they wanted to come on and we could talk about it with them, you know, they could send us the, the dream and uh, we could talk about it with them and they could share their thoughts or if they're camera shy and really don't want to come on the podcast, but would love to have their dream out there, they could send it to us and uh, in, in send us their in written thoughts. form. In written form. In written form. Yeah. Just send us in an email. Uh, mm -hmm in written form, the dream, and, and maybe some of their thoughts about the dream, and then we can share the dream with the community and some of our own thoughts about it, if that's what they'd like mm. um, to do. So, but that would just sort of open the gate way into the dream time, you know, make a port, dreams are portals into other worlds, and uh, we can just open the portal gates a little bit and, and see what the dreaming might have uh, to tell us through that kind of activity with your community. Absolutely. And can you just speak a little more about what what would you call a big dream? You know, you've spoken about a couple of yours. I mean, the one in the Serengeti, that's a big dream. Is I mean, that'll fascinate you for all of your days, probably. I right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, I, I wonder exactly what words Jung uses, but Jung was the one I think that came up with the concept of having these that that we have these big dreams. And those are our, really our life dreams. They're the ones that mean something to us, um, you know, in terms of our life journey, our life path, our life meaning, purpose, you know, whatever whatever those words would be. They're the, the dreams that uh, tell us sort of 
who we are, what we know, how to live, all those things that, you know, and, and probably many to most people have these dreams that have just stayed with them forever. You know, I hear about it since I work with dreams, people tend to tell me their stories and it's, and it's really fun to, you know, yeah. hear them. But, you know, uh, a lot of people have had a dream or several dreams that have just been their guiding lights the, or the, or the most sort of curious, you know, maybe they've never really had anybody to help them even understand what it is, but they've never forgotten it and never stopped sort of grappling with why it feels so important to them, but never understood it. And those especially are really good ones to talk about, mm. start to unpack a little and start to, you know, tease out, you know, what, why that, uh, stays with you so powerfully. Um, it's kind of so, there's some sense of body knowing that it's important, isn't it? It's like you know this is it's somehow important, but again, you know there might there seems to be many layers to them sometimes, and and perhaps you know on one level I get that dream, and then there's there's always seems to be more kind of layers as well sometimes. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, some dreams, they just tell us truth. They tell a story to the whole uh, community. You know, like, let me just tell you another one here, John, just for a minute, because this one I feel like is for everyone. Maybe my Uluru dream, maybe my tiger in the heart, birth canal of the heart dream. Maybe those are more about me and my personal journey. Mm. But this one I think is you know, I think it's for everyone. Hmm. And in this dream, it's very simple. Um, in this dream, this was, I was in my 40s. I'm 73 now. So it was a, quite a while ago, but I'll never forget it. I think about it every day, probably. The dream said just these words, you have to listen to the space between heartbeats. And in the dream, my heart would beat. And then I'd I flew out into the far reaches of the cosmos. I was one with everything in the cosmos. And then boom, the heart would beat and I was back in my body. And then I would float out and I was part of everything. All that is, the dark starry sky, I was one with everything. And then boom, my heart would beat and I was back in the body. And that happened over and over in the dream where I was having this experience and it was so irritating that my heart was beating and bringing me back because I wanted to stay there. That was just awesome. Being in the body was, you know, this dense kind of experience and I wasn't as excited about it. But then I realized as the dream went on that this is a dance, you know, that you're always in this vast consciousness and then you put your feet on the ground and then you're in. And so it's like you, the space between heartbeats. It's, and it's what the Buddhists call the space between thoughts. You have to listen to the space between thoughts, but it was so visceral, visceral for me in this dream. And it's just, I feel like that's for all of us. It's like this space between our heartbeats, yeah. the space between our thoughts. Mm. We have to listen to that. That's where the unconsciousness is. That's where the, the vast truth of everything is. That's where the, the reality that we all share is fully alive with us. And it's just between every heartbeat and every thought. And so we're just as in touch with that as we are with the foot on the ground. So I think that dream belongs to everybody. That's just something that tells us how it is, how to, yeah. how to think, how to go, how to think. Yeah, that's good. Um, so dreams like that, uh, you know, are certainly life dreams, uh, big dreams, but I think, so, you know, some of them just tell the story, you know, it's like a myth that can be told that everyone can relate to in their own yeah. kind of way. Yeah. And those, those dreams want to be heard. They want us to, yeah. you know, they want us to tell them, they want to be known. Yeah. So send them in. That's what we're saying. Send them in. If you've yeah. had a big dream yeah. and you want to talk about it, send it in. Sorry. Thanks. Um, very much. That's great. And uh, I'm going to put your link on the website, of course, to your web page. But you've also got something coming up, haven't you? Um, oh, right. Thank you for remembering. Yes, I am teaching a course this summer. Yeah. Uh, 
I I don't have it ready to deliver the information on it yet. It's called "We Keep Our Eyes on the Night: Reviving the Indigenous Mind." Yeah, and it's going to be about working with the, all of this consciousness, the indigenous mind, the dreaming, and the dreaming tracks, and the um, all of it. Um, and the course will start on July 29th, and it goes for five weeks. Um, and five very soon, weeks, that, five weeks solid. Five weeks starting. I'm pretty sure it's July 29th, and then 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 the first four weeks in August. Mm. Uh, it's going to be on a Wednesday, I believe. Uh, but then it'll be recorded, so people who can't be there in person can get the the course. But I'm teaching that course this summer about all of this about. Yeah the indigenous mind and the dreaming and how to work with dreams and think about all these uh, ways of thinking about the dream time. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited about the course. It's going to be fun. And so everybody's welcome. If you go to my website, tariaward.com, which I know you'll have the link for that. Yeah. Um, uh, then, uh, and sign up for my, my mailing list then you'll get the information as soon as it's ready to be delivered, which will be soon. Um, you'll get the information about joining the course if you'd like to do that. Okay. And it could be a fun way to start working, you know, uh, a little more intensively with these ideas. Thanks, Daria. And thanks for sharing um, all your experience with the dreaming psyche and the dreaming world. Um, I'm looking forward to thank you for thinking of this idea of working with the community in this way and getting the community's dreams. I, I love the idea, John. Thank you for, for uh, thinking of it and for opening the gate for that. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>